Old Testament reading, and uh, we'll start from Exodus chapter 3 and verse 1 to 15. So having already read this scripture earlier, what are we finding here? What is, what is going on? What is God trying to teach us from this scripture? And we see here that Moses, um, he kept the flock, so he was doing something quite menial. He was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, um, and he was the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. So here we have Abram going about his daily work, looking after his father-in-law's flock, uh, his herds, and he then ends up at the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So you can imagine, what would that be like for you to suddenly come upon something that was totally supernatural, um, and you would be almost blown away by this. You'd, you'd suddenly come across this supernatural aspect um, in your everyday life. And it's a little bit like that when we come to God, isn't it? We are getting on with our, our world, as we were. We've been brought up in this world. We carry on with what the world is suggesting we do. We, we uh, develop and grow and we go to school and we learn all about evolution, which is a load of rubbish. And certainly we get to the point where we begin to become very worldly. <coughs> we're following what the world is teaching us. We are in the mammon system. <coughs> we are under Satan's rule. And there's nothing really that, um, that would change that <coughs> unless God would intervene. That's where we would be now. That's where we would continue to be. But now, of course, we are in the world, but we're no longer of the world. We are now citizens of heaven. We have a different king. <coughs> it's a bit like being in enemy territory now. Um, you know, like a parachuter being parachuted into uh, another kingdom, another nation, <coughs> behind enemy lines. And so suddenly now we're in the world, but we're not of the world anymore. You know, we're in it. And there's nothing we can do about that. That's the flesh. And we're still, to a certain degree, we're still in Egypt. We have to live in Egypt. <coughs> but we are spiritual. <coughs> we have bought, been born again spiritually. And so now we are open <coughs> to what God is going to show us. And we want to serve our new king, wherever we are whatever we're doing. And this is an eye-opener now for Moses, because he comes to this bush and it's burning, but it's, it's, not, it's not burning up. It's just this fire in this bush. <coughs> Imagine what that's like. And he says, I'll now turn aside and see this great sight. Why the bush does not burn? <coughs> Verse 4 says, So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, I can imagine that, imagine that, you were going about your daily w work and then you, you come to this event, something's on fire, <coughs> and suddenly this voice comes, <coughs> you know, it's a bit of a wake up call, isn't it, either you think you're going a bit loopy, either you think that you are, you're really losing your mind, <coughs> or you would be overcome with the fact that this was some supernatural being. This was something almost unbelievable. This was a real event. And uh, he said, do not draw near this place. <coughs> God says, take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. So there is a sense in which we need to understand the awesome reality of God, that God lives in unapproachable light. This is what he's showing us here that God is a spirit God, a spirit being, and he lives in unapproachable light. And if we are to come into his presence, we have to come in to his presence with respect, with fear and trembling. We have to be aware that this is God Almighty. And Moses is being told by God, <laughs> you know, be careful how you approach me. Don't just come with disrespect. You know, I am God, after all, you know. And I am holy. And so wherever I am, the ground is holy. Wherever I, wherever I set my foot, it's anointed. Wherever I am, there is holiness. 
this is what God is saying when the presence of God comes upon you there is holiness and anything that is of sin a sinful nature or anti-God is going to be consumed is going to be burnt up you are not going to be able to stand so you have to be very very careful in verse 6 says, moreover he said I am the God of your father the God of Abraham the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob so you know this is he's making himself known to Moses even though Moses was a Jew and at the same time Moses had been taken into Pharaoh's house and he became part of this new household and suddenly God comes to him and he recognizes God's voice and he realizes that it must be God and so he, he reminds him of his roots of his of the fact that he has already dealt with his forefathers and Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look upon God so it's no surprise that Moses had this reaction I think I would have had the same reaction I'm sure most of us would if we're faced with God and God <coughs> starts to speak with us if we didn't know the love of God if we didn't know the fatherhood of God if we didn't understand how Jesus has shown us the love of his father if Jesus hadn't shown us that we could be in relationship with him, we would be hiding our face in fear if God was to speak to us if God would talk to us in our minds we'd be worried and many people come to us because they've had experiences with God and they get a bit worried and some people even think that they may be losing their mind and of course people outside are already there they're all there ready to mock you and say I think you've lost your brain you know you've gone you've gone a bit dulali you know something wrong with you you know what's all this God business what's all this nonsense about someone who died 2,000 years ago what are you trying to do you know what you know you can't live on love I mean what, what are you doing you need to get on with your work you need to get on with your life and forget about all this nonsense you know this is what the mockers would say and so Moses Moses recognizes you know once you're impacted with God and it may just be that impact between you and God other people may not be aware of it they may be oblivious remember Paul the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus he saw this great light and he was blinded and God spoke to him the others didn't know anything about it well God works in these mysterious ways and so God can speak to you today and nobody else can really understand why you're impacted. God spoke to me and my friends thought it was the funniest thing they'd ever heard. George Booty getting saved. George Booty having an encounter with God. That's amazing. What are you talking about? I must come and find out about this. And it was a great witness <laughs> because there was a conversion and you know the old self was really taken to a different place. And so this is what happens. And Moses had this experience. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. So he's actually, he's not just touching his life. He's not just impacting Moses like he could impact any one of us here with his word today. <clears throat> but he's now calling him for a purpose. And this is where people get confused sometimes. We get this idea of, gentle Jesus meek and mild that's going to come and and make your life so much better and this is a sort of Sunday school kind of way because we don't want to frighten children we don't want to talk about hell we don't want to talk about eternal damnation <clears throat> we don't want to talk about the the harsher things of of what the gospel brings us out of <clears throat> and so we tell them all the nice little stories about Jesus and of course Jesus is meek and mild Jesus is loving Jesus is kind Jesus is merciful and, and sacrificial and loving. We know all those things. That's great. But he doesn't call you just for yourself to feel better. And this is where people get confused. And so for young Christians, this, this can be a bit of an eye-opener too. This is what they call modern terminology. This is a game changer. This is something that changes how you see God and how you see your life in the light of understanding about God you know so this is a situation where 
Moses is already he's being spoken to by God and he's being called immediately to service. God's called him for a reason. God has called each one of us for a reason. Each one of us has a purpose in God. And you might think, oh, well, I, I've already been there, you know. There, there may be people that have, have been saved for a while and think, yeah, well, you know, I know God called me for a purpose and I've been involved in the purpose that God's called me. Um, I know all that stuff. And think that whatever it was that he called you to, that's it, you've done the, the job. You, you've been coming to church for quite some time. Um, you've got on with your little world and you carried on coming to church, but you haven't really become part of the overall plan of God in your life. God has a plan and purpose for each one of us and it then depends on whether we step into it or not. God will talk to you. If God has called you and brought you to church and you are one of his people that he has redeemed, that he has forgiven, that he has elevated to become a saint in the kingdom of God, if you have become adopted into his family, he's got a purpose for you. He didn't do that for nothing. He didn't do that for the feel-good factor, which we all go about looking for today. If it feels good, I'll do it. If it don't feel good, oh, damn, don't ask me to do that. Don't talk about commitment and discipline. No, no they're, they're obviously bad words. I can't cope with those words. But God calls us for a purpose. He doesn't just call us so that we have a little bit better life. God calls us to become family members and soldiers in the kingdom and to be part of this movement of God to bring other people to God and to be part of his body which is a spiritual body but of course it involves physical bodies that's us and so it is a spiritual body we become spiritual people rather than just physical people we all have a spiritual side of us and it's either alive or dead in Christ. So this is what's happening. Moses is being called by God and he's being asked to do something. He says, My people who are in Egypt, and I've heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. I've seen all this oppression, he says. I've seen the world that you live in today. This is what he's saying. I've seen the world that you actually come out of, that you are still part of, but you're not... You're in the world, but you're not of the world. I can see what's going on around you, and I can see all the damage that's been taking place and all the oppression that's going on. I know the people's sorrows. People may be saying, oh, I'm fine, but we know what that means in psychotherapy terms. Fine means something completely different. You know, It means that we have issues. We have a false self that we present to the world to say it's okay. You know, we come to church and, and people say, how are you? And we go, oh, I'm fine, how are you? And maybe that's as far as it goes and maybe people aren't open enough to talk about their life, which is sad, because we should. You know, we are to confess our sins to one another. We are to be open. We're not to be closed to people. We are to be the people of God. And that means being open and allowing people in and building relationship and letting people know a bit about what, uh, what's going on in our lives so that we can relate to one another, so we can uh, encourage one another and help one another. If we don't know anything about what's going on in your life, how can people help? But we have to have this false self. We have to present this false self because we're worried about people seeing anything, knowing anything. There's a real defensiveness there which we have to break down. Christ breaks that down. We should not be hiding our light under a bushel. We should not be people of darkness. We should be people of light. We've come to a God is a God of light. And Moses is one of these people that God chooses and calls to a particular plan, a task, because he's heard the cry of the people who are all oppressed by the Egyptians. He says in verse 8, So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. Well, that's what he's telling us to do. In Matthew's Gospel, he says, Go into all nations and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He's calling us to service. He's calling us to witness to other people. That's his, that's his work. That's what he wants us to do. It's part of 
what do you want? So what is your mission? If you don't know what your mission is, or, or if you think, well, I had my mission 30 years ago, or 20 years ago, or 10 years ago, or 5 years ago, or 3 years ago, and now it's gone, you're not really getting with the program. Because God has got a purpose for you, and he is the Alpha and the Omega, as you can see up there. And he is the author and finisher of our faith. He doesn't put us on the scrap heap. He doesn't do that. He, once we're called by God, his calling, we're told in Romans, is irrevocable. His gifts and his calling is they are irrevocable. He can't go back on himself. If he's called you, he's called you for a reason. Do you know what that reason is? Have you found what that reason is? Are you serving God at the moment, in any shape or form? Or are you serving mammon, self, other people, other situations, and not following what God wants for you? This is important. This is what God's calling Moses for here. He wants him to do something. He didn't just call him, Moses, Moses, come and sit with me for a little while. Let me hold your hand. Let me make your life better. Let me stroke you a little bit and tell you how good you are. Mm. No, he didn't do that, did he? <laughs> oh, he didn't. Okay, so he wants you to bring them up from that land. So he wants you to take them from that land, take them from Egypt to a land flowing with milk and honey. This is a type of salvation right here. This is a type of salvation where we are delivered from Egypt and brought into the kingdom of light. No longer do we, are we under Satan's control. We are under God's control from then on, once we have been redeemed and brought out. And to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. There's a lot of ites there, aren't there? <coughs> <laughs> I don't know why we have to have ites, but we've got ites. But anyway, you can laugh, but it's these are the people of Canaan. Verse 9 says, Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me. <laughs> and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. So he's really hammering the point home. He's already said about them being oppressed and having taskmasters. But he's really hammering this point home that the cries have actually come to him that God is a father God these are his people these are his children the Jewish nation was God's children and still are God's children they still are his chosen people and that's why we must not ever come against Israel we must not come against the, the people of God we are to be one with the people of God we are to encourage the people of God and support the people of God and in this world there is so much that is anti-Semitism that still comes from the time of Hitler and before that and right the way through there is this anti-Semitism and we should not be a part of it this is wrong we as believers we are engrafted branches into that holy line of the Jewish nation this is our roots our roots are Abraham Isaac and Jacob you have to realize that that's why when Paul went preaching he went first to the synagogue he always went to the Jew first then to the Gentile because the whole amount of the the Jews have got to come in as the whole amount of the Gentiles need to come in before that final run up with the Jewish people where they they come to the Lord properly fully but the Gentiles have to come in first because they rejected God they rejected Jesus and so the reason for their problems after that was because they rejected Jesus and so the gospel was given to the Gentiles through Paul and then through the other apostles but always first to the Jew because they were his chosen people and so we have to understand that this is what's going on in God's mind that these are his people and their cries have come up so when you are crying and when you're in difficulties when you're in problems and when you're specifically when you're being oppressed you know we cry out to the Lord he hears us he really hears us he hears your cross he knows what's going on he sees what's going on 
He doesn't make us all robots. He gives us a mind so that we can be involved with all sorts of things. And then when we come under oppression, because we've kind of gone off like sheep and fell in a ditch, he hears your cries. Does that make sense? Are you, are you with me so far? Okay. So he's heard about the children who have been oppressed. And in verse 10 says, Come now, therefore, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I? Who am I? He's tending his father-in-law's flocks. He's just an ordinary Joe. He's just someone who is going about his business. Okay, we know that he had quite an amazing upbringing. Um, and there was a miraculous event that happened around his birth and going into Pharaoh's house. But who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? So because of Moses' um, past life, as a child growing up in Pharaoh, he knew the power of Pharaoh. He knew that Pharaoh was like a god to people in the world, in Egypt. Verse 12, so he said, I will certainly be with you, and this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. So God speaks to Moses and tells him, look, you know, you're not alone. So you might think, well, in today's world, I'm in the world, I'm not of the world, but you know, the world's not interested in what I'm saying, the world's going to persecute me, the world's going to mock me, the world is going to give, give me problems. If I start, I might, I might feel ashamed to start talking about God because these people, some of them are very intelligent and you know, they've got loads of answers and I can't answer these questions, I don't know all the answers to all the questions and I can't always explain what I believe or what I feel and so I don't want to to speak too much about God because you know they're going to they're going to give me a hard time and Moses is just an ordinary Joe he knows the power of Pharaoh and he's going to be told to go to Pharaoh to bring God's people out of Egypt imagine what you feel like when you know that situation you realize the awesomeness of what this task is that you've been given it's not just an ordinary little task is it he said, I've sent, he said, and this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Well, that's great, isn't it? God says, once you've done what I asked you to do, then I'll show you that actually I sent you. <laughs> Hang on a minute. <laughs> uh, so so I'm, I'm calling you to do something. So I'm, I'm saying to you, go out and talk to people about Jesus Christ and to bring them to salvation and then I'm going to give you a sign to say that I'm with you when, when you did it mm. afterwards okay this is a good deal no it teaches us something it teaches us about faith it teaches about stepping out in faith you know when we can't see what's in front of us but we're stepping out in faith faith is the substance of things hoped for we have to trust God. There has to come a point in your life where you stop trusting in yourself and tr stop trusting and worrying about what other people can do to you, which they can only harm the body, and trusting God who has all power that can deal with everything and He can actually deal with your soul. People can't. This is the awesomeness of God. And this is what Moses is beginning to come to terms with. Verse 13, Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? I don't know what to say. I'm just someone tending herds. God said to Moses, verse 14, I am who I am. That in itself is a mystery for us. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. I am has sent me to you. Verse 15, Moreover God said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of God, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all 
generations. So he's given him very clear instructions of what to do, but he does say, wait, trust me. There's two things here. Trust me, first of all. You have to move into a position of faith in trust. Faith is trust. And at the same time, you have to be patient so that I will then show you after the event you've got to trust me for this and after the event it will be confirmed to you that it was me who sent you now that may be difficult for some of us it may be difficult to to cope with the idea that we have to act in faith first and then God will confirm it afterwards he's calling you and he's got a plan for your life but you don't know what the plan is what is the plan that God's got for each one of you can you tell me no you can't I can't tell you what the plan of God is in my life I've got no clue God has already taken me to places I never expected to be God has already done things in my life that I never anticipated God has already plucked me out of situations that were dire that I had no clue about was going to happen and I know that God isn't finished with me the best is yet to come right because God's in control so if if that's the case and God has called me and I don't know where I'm going I just know that God's with me because he's He's shown me. It's been tested over time, so I know. But it doesn't mean to say that we're finished now. It means that there's something more. God wants me to do something, and as he leads me, then I shall go. He is the great shepherd of the sheep. So therefore, we need to be following what God wants in our lives, not our own agendas. Unless we get with God's plan, we're going to fail. Later on, when we look at the New Testament, Jesus tells us something about being prepared and what kind of life you're going to lead. And we'll talk about that in the next New Testament video that we're going to bring out in, in, you know, shortly. Anyway, the important thing is we've got to trust God. That's what Moses is being taught here, that when God calls you, you should go. When God calls you to something new, even though you don't know where you're going and you don't know how it's going to work out and you don't know what you're going to say even, nevertheless, you should step out in faith, trust in God for the direction he's taking you and be prepared to commit yourself to whatever task he's given you, whatever mission he's given you. Okay? That's what it's... That's what the message is. It's about following what God's called you to. Okay, so let's just go to um, our next reading in the Old Testament, which is in Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 15 